I'm Patrick Lewis, the Director of Collections and Research at the Filson Historical Society. And I'd like to thank you for joining us both in person and virtually for today's program. Thank you again for joining us for the legacy of Black Louisville educator, author, and community leader, Joseph Seaman Cotter Sr. Today's program is sponsored by Dinsmore Family Wealth Planning. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Emma Bryan is a public historian and cultural worker based in Louisville, Kentucky. She currently works for the Filson Historical Society as the Community Engagement Specialist. She received her Bachelor of Arts in History and Philosophy from Bellarmine University and her Master of Arts in History from the University of Louisville. Additionally, she works as a community-based oral historian and is a member of the 2022-23 Kentucky Rural Urban Exchange Cohort. Natalie Woods has served as branch manager of the Historic Western Library since 2017. She serves on several committees in the Russell neighborhood, including acting as consulting party for the redevelopment of Beecher Terrace and the Greater Russell Equity Education, Equity and Economic and Self-Sufficiency Equity Task Groups. Kentucky native Bernard Clay, hailing from Louisville as an artist, deeply connected to the state's natural and urban realms. With an MFA in creative writing, he's a member of the Afrolachian Poets Collective and has been featured in various publications. He now resides in Eastern Kentucky, where he tends to his garden, writes, and works a remote day job. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. First, Emma Bryan. I couldn't say sitting down. I was too excited. <laughs> Hi, uh, you all are making me nervous. So beautiful. Um, good afternoon. I'm really excited for you to hear from Natalie Woods and Bernard Clay. Um, so we're going to try to move as quickly and as authentically as possible through this. There's so much for you to learn um, from this man and his work and, and the legacy of Joseph Seaman Cotter um, that we could be here all day, but we're not going to do that. Um, we're going to be here for an hour. Um, so the way it's going to work is I'm going to present some of my research um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Cotter in conversation with Blackface Minstrelsy, which was the popular um, entertainment of the era for, for white folks. Um, and then Natalie is going to come up and talk about the history of the Western Branch Library um, and a little bit more about the legacy projects that she is working on um, for Reverend Thomas Blue and Professor Cotter. And then Bernard Clay is going to come up and share a reading of his own poetry and some of Cotter's poetry as well. So you're in for a real treat. Um, and these people are the legacy work, the legacy energy behind this project. So we're, we're going to get to them quickly. Um, before I move any further, however, we've got to get a baseline on who this man is. So Joseph Seaman Cotter was born on February 2nd, 1861 in Bardstown, Kentucky. Um, he was born to a woman named Martha Vaughn. Due to his family's lack of resources, their poverty, Cotter was forced to quit his education at a very young age. He stopped going to traditional school at eight years old so that he could go to work. Um, he worked as a manual laborer. Um, he worked in brickyards, in bourbon distilleries, um, and he worked as a teamster on the levee. Um, much of his early learning came to him in the songs and stories of his mother. Um, Martha had taught her own self to read and then taught Cotter to read, and she herself composed her own song stories and plays. So she's a writer in her own, in her own way. <clears throat> In 1883, at the age of 22, um, Cotter decided to attend night school. He started, he wanted to go back to school, and that was from the prodding of a Black Louisville educator named Dr. William T. Payton. Um, and so after only 10 short months of being in night school, Cotter launched his teaching career. Um, he began in the primary department in night school due to his lack of prior formal education, um, but then quickly launched into his career. Cotter served on the faculty of the Western Colored School, which was located at 15th and Magazine. He became the principal of a school that he co-founded um, from 1893 to 1911, which was named for his contemporary and friend, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Not the, not the Dunbar School in Lexington, there was one here. 
Um, and then he, he eventually became the principal of the Samuel L. Coleridge Taylor School in 1911, which still exists to this day. It's a Montessori school, um, but he was there for 31 years until his retirement. <clears throat> In 1956, less than 10 years after his death, an elementary school in JCPS in the Jefferson County Public School System was named in Cotter's honor, the Joseph S. Cotter Elementary, and this school closed in the 1990s. I would be remiss if we didn't mention Cotter's work towards proper housing and healthy communities. Um, he was a proud resident, early resident of Little Africa or Need More, um, which uh, our folks are gonna talk about a little bit more today. Um, little Africa transitioned to the Cotter Homes Project in 1948, which is one year before his death. He passed away in 1949. That isn't all of his bio. He has so much more to him, um, but we got to move on. And if and if I'm up here at 1220, somebody drag me away. Um, okay. So to fully understand Cotter's social work and artistic practice, it's necessary to understand his family's history um, and how they influenced his life and career. So his mother, Martha, her parents, their names were Lucinda and Fleming Vaughn. Um, they purchased a 39 acre farm in Nelson County, Kentucky, and they named it Flynn, Flim Hollow. The Vaughn Cotter family story is marred by hardships and traumas alongside joy and creativity, um, which unfortunately are not dissimilar to those which black free people are experiencing during this time in American history. Um, so due to his family's poverty, Fleming, Martha's father, sold seven of his children, including Martha, into bond enslavement in 1853. At age 14, Martha's bond, bond enslavement was transferred to the Rowans at Federal Hill, the Federal Hill Plantation, which we now know as my old Kentucky home state park. Um, here, Vaughn made less than $4 a month. She milked the cows, she cut the wood, she cooked every meal for the family, and she even nursed the twin daughters, May and Maud. Vaughn lived in bond enslavement and worked um, around Bardstown in Louisville for many years. She eventually settled with the Cotter family in Louisville. She worked for them as a nurse. Her father, Fleming, was um, really anxious that Martha was going to be sold further south. Um, and so he drafted her free papers in 1859. Um, once she was liberated, um, she continued to work for the Cotter family. Um, and um, two years after her liberation, she bore her son, Joseph Cotter, um, who was born out of a sexual relationship between her prior owner and current boss. His name was Michael it's, it's Scottish, Irish, so it's like Mikel, Michael, Cotter. Um, Lucinda Vaughn, the grandmother of Cotter and Martha's mother, was a Black, a black enslaved woman um, who was eventually freed, and then Fleming um, was of Cherokee ancestry, and Martha was described by her son Joseph in the following paragraph, which maybe you've had a chance to read. Um, and I'm, I'm going to skip it for now, but I hope that you can, can look at those words and, and feel them and hear them. And um, yeah, um, this quote is pulled directly from Cotter's autobiography, which is held at the Western Branch Library, which you'll get to hear more about. The, t the chapter is titled Lucinda Vaughn um, that this comes from. I mentioned this because we are all products of our youth and Cotter was indelibly shaped by his family history, by the strong will and determination of his mother. Um, and, and she was in turn shaped by hers. So why are we talking about Cotter today? What brings us to this moment and, and why, are, why am I standing here talking about this? Well, it's for a couple of reasons. Um, my interest and introduction to Cotter came through theater. Um, I was introduced to the field of history through historical interpretation, through reenactment. Um, we could talk about that another time. Um, and so in graduate school, when I was studying public history, I was interested in the ways um, historical concepts are played out on stage through different times of hi history. I, 
I chose a specific time period, a specific theater in his in, in Louisville. Don't know why. I really don't have an answer to why I chose this. I knew I needed to write something and this seemed cool. And U of L had a lot of collections related to it. Um, so very quickly, I, I was interested in studying Macaulay's theater, um, which is located on Walnut which what was Walnut and now Muhammad Ali, it's the building is not there any longer. It was only there from 1873 to 1925. Um, but very quickly in my research, it took a turn um, because I encountered blackface minstrelsy at Macaulay's theater. And I was aware that blackface minstrelsy was um, an art form um, was a popular thing that that happened that white people dressed up in blackface and characterized black people. Um, I just wasn't aware how popular and pervasive it, it was. Um, and so that is for two reasons why I didn't know that and maybe why you don't know that too. Um, one of which, luckily, thankfully, we no longer white people no longer dress up in blackface and pretend to be black people overtly. Um, and secondly, a lot of the early television shows and um, films that were produced that feature blackface themes and, and actually, um, you know, black pork on a face have been taken out of syndication, so you cannot access them anymore. Um, and I will say, and these are, these are the big names, this is Disney, this is Universal Studios, um, if you have a morbid curiosity and you are doing it in the name of research, you may find them on YouTube. And that is for research purposes only. Um, okay. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, this is Macaulay's theater. This is the, the opening night. There's the physical building. Um, quick content trigger warning for folks. Um, I am not doing this to memorialize, to re-traumatize, or rehash any of this. I think it's important to talk about this um, because these harmful and dangerous stereotypes were cemented into the audience members' heads. And who's in the audience? White people and Black people are in the audience. These stereotypes were created by white people to perform on stage in the end, stolen from, stolen from authentic Black life and Black experience. So this is antebellum period is when it's born, 1830s, continues throughout the Civil War, and it's highly popularized throughout Reconstruction and into Jim Crow. Harmful and dangerous caricatures of Black folks are acted out on stage by white people, cementing racist ideas into the audience member's head and they're passed down to us either consciously or unconsciously. So I'm gonna show a few images and we gotta quickly move through this. And I know this is not fun to look at. It's horrific and horrifying, but I'm gonna need you to look at it for just a few minutes. No time to read all that text. I included all of it because um, this is taken from U of L archives, their photo archives, digital archives, and they have this really great paragraph this image depicts African Americans in a stereotype fashion that may be offensive. U of L does not endorse the content or expression. However, these images do present the attitudes and assumptions of some people in the period in which they were produced. The cultural record would be incomplete and we would not be honest with ourselves in our past if these images were omitted. I really appreciated that as a researcher. I'm sure other folks have come across that too. And I don't know who wrote this, but I, I give praise to them. Um, again, horrific. I'm including two, these two images for two reasons. The first one, this guy, the big head, um, the, vi the visual is important, right? We see what's happening in the, in the visual. I don't have to tell you what's going on. The second, um, George Wilson here, this is important to me because this is the first picture, photo of blackface that I saw in U of L's archives and it really, stuck with me. What it amazes me about this is he signs it, yours truly, George Wilson. Body language, cannot go into it, but I want you to look at it and now that you see it, you will never not see it. I'm sorry, it's everywhere. So now we get to, we get to move away from that and we move directly into something altogether wholesome. Um, so why Cotter and why minstrelsy? What do these two people have 
um, in common and in relationship, what is going on? Um, it's everything. I believe that Cotter's work, um, his authorship was, and, and, and his actions were a lifelong project of community uplift as an educator, a community leader, and an author who worked tirelessly to confront the dominant and inaccurate representations of Blackness in theater and literature. Cotter's art was formed in response to and in conversation with Louisville's white community and their ideas of racial superiority. Like Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Cotter utilized something called the Negro dialect in his poetry, which is a dual purpose. He's using the dialect to appease and appeal to white people because they are going to be familiar with menstrual forms as it's all that they watch essentially and listen to. Um, so they're not going to, they're not going to catch it, right? They're not going to know what's going on. Um, and he shifts it and reclaims it back into an, an authentic um, and personal, he's reclaiming these stolen and, and, and twisted um, forms. Author Eugene Redmond described Cotter as among the first Black poets to represent without shame and minstrelsy authentic Black folk life. And you'll get to hear Cotter's poems from Bernard Clay. Cotter dedicated his life to the next generation of Black citizens, both his own biological children, um, as well as the children of his community. Um, and for Cotter, the child is the only force that raises or lowers a community. Cotter viewed his literature as a part of the broader social movement led by Booker T. Washington. Even though Cotter held little to no political power in the city of Louisville, his writings reflect his leadership um, and Black community uplift efforts and his resistance to white supremacy. Cotter fo fought for social justice and liberation in a way that was taught to him by his mother. And in the only way he could find a voice that white people listened to in the Jim Crow South, which was through the cultural production of storytelling. Here, I'm gonna transition to Natalie Woods, the branch manager of the Western Library, and she's gonna tell you more about Cotter and his work at the library. Um, this is his son, Joseph Seaman Cotter Jr. Um, he passed away really young of tuberculosis. Um, this is a, I wanted to include a photo of Cotter in older age, because um, we see those, those images of him as a young man, but there he is. All right, Natalie, and I'm gonna, Click for you. Before I get started, I want to um, say thank you to Emma, who spent a large amount of time in the archives at Western doing her research. Um, I felt like we became besties at that point. She was in there so much. Um, but I want you to know and publicly say to you how proud I am of you to see how dedicated you were to that. You weren't lip service. You're out here doing that work. And I am super, super proud of you. So I want to give you another round of applause. Okay. I got 15 minutes. It's like that commercial. You got 30 seconds. I'm going to get it out there. I got a lot of stuff to give you. So my name is Natalie Woods. I am the manager of the Western Library. I'm going to give you a little bit of the background of Western. Um, for those who are not familiar with Western, we opened in 1905 and we were the first full service library built for and ran by African Americans. We sit at the corner of Tith and Chestnut just down the street from Central High School. The Western Library exists today thanks to the efforts of Albert Mazik, who was the principal of Central High School in the early 1900s. He wanted to take his students to the library and was unable to due to the Jim Crow laws at the time. So he petitioned to have Western built and thanks to the hard work of many standing along with him and the donation made by Andrew Carnegie, Western was created to begin serving this community. While Western was being built, it started in three rooms of a house located at 1125 West Chestnut Street. The house is no longer standing, but to give you a visualization is something that Emma mentioned, Coleridge Taylor, where it sits at today is where the house was. So building Western was a very important step to providing services to a very deserving community. But there also needed to be a leader chosen to guide those efforts along the way. That leader was Reverend Thomas Fountain Blue. 
Um, he was the first African-American to head a public library in the nation. Reverend Blue was not a trained librarian because at that time, just as with the library, if you were black, you could not attend library school. So being the leader and the visionary that he was, he, along with Rachel Harris, who was over the children's department, developed the curriculum to run a library school out of Western. And they came from all over the South to learn how to take those library services back to their communities. I mentioned that he was not a trained librarian. He had to work a million times harder than his counterparts to learn and know what being a librarian was supposed to be. I believe that he defined it in a whole new way. He was so dedicated to it that he wrote about how to provide those services in great detail. For example, what information is needed to know what books there are in your collection? You know, um, if somebody wants to check out a book, what information do you need about that particular person and the item they're taking out? You know, and what items should really be in your collection? There are all things that we do today. What Reverend Blue wrote about back then, you know, um, helped him be more successful in his efforts because not only was Western was so successful, they also had the Eastern Colored Branch, which sat on Lambton Street. He also ran, I do believe, the library inside of Central High School. So they were doing all these other side projects along the way. Um, he was also the first African-American to speak at the American Library Association Conference. Reverend Thomas Fountain Blue was far ahead of his time and paved the way for someone like me to come along and have the ability to attend library school and become a certified librarian. He was a mentor to many during his time and even today through his writings. I started a program a few years ago called the Figures of Eastern Cemetery in partnership with the Friends of Eastern Cemetery, specifically a wonderful woman by the name of Savannah Dar, to help share the history that is there and to give those long forgotten their voices back. I'm sure that many of you have heard about the history of Eastern Cemetery. There are 16,000 graves with over 100,000 people in them, which means they are buried on top of each other. Um, it's hard to hear that, right? Like you can't imagine and fathom how bad that is. Well, the very first program we decided to do was based on the people of Russell. And that's when we made the discovery that Reverend Blue was buried in Eastern Cemetery in an unmarked grave. And so began my four year journey. <laughs> As many people who know me in this room know, it, I was not, I was like a dog with a bone. I was not giving up. Um, I, I took this whole journey for over four years to make sure that we righted that wrong. So um, Emma, if you will click it. He now has a headstone. We put that headstone on there last year. I wanted to make sure that he had, um, he was represented and honored in the way that he should be. As you will see on the headstone, Miss Cornelia, his wife, who was Lyman T. Johnson's sister, to give you a little bit more of a history, um, is buried there. I hear a doggy. Uh, and there, so there's pictures of Reverend Blue and Miss Cornelia and Western to know what that is. Emma, if you will click again. Because they are buried on top of other people, we do not know their names due to the way that the records were kept by the original owners of that cemetery. I wanted to make sure that there was something on the back of the headstone that also honored them. So in memory of those buried here before, they are not forgotten because that's what it's all about is making sure that they are also honored. Um, and doing that journey and trying to get this headstone, I wanna publicly again, thank the people who helped me to do that was Rachel Platt from the Fraser Museum, Joy McAtee and Michael Meeks from the Office of Equity. Again, Savannah Dar from the Friends of Eastern Cemetery, who is also a historic preservation officer for Louisville Metro government. And also the Library Foundation who helped to us to fund these things along with other people along the way that helped us to be able to get this done. I wanted to make sure that by placing that, that their legacies remain and they are no longer forgotten. Um, there are others buried uh, on these graves throughout that cemetery that also need to be honored. Uh, Professor Cotter also has family buried there and he himself is buried in Greenwood Cemetery, which was also owned by the same people. But um, in, through this journey, I've had the honor and was granted the privilege of meeting Reverend Blue's granddaughter, Miss Annette Blue. Um, and it's, it's very kind of surreal to have that connection to him. Now I'm running the branch that he ran all those years ago and had that connection with his family. But in our conversations, I told her that I will continue to do what I can to make sure that her grandfather is acknowledged and his legacy is protected for years to come and that he is not forgotten. 
Speaking of protecting legacies, I am now on that same mission for Professor Cotter, which is, of course, why we're here today. Um, Professor Cotter created a program called the Cotter Cup that started back in 1913. You got the next image for me? This is, of course, the picture that you saw a second ago. This is um, Professor Cotter holding the Cotter Cup and some of the participants standing around him. It was a storytelling contest that started that the children attended story time. If they could recite the stories, whoever could recite them the best won the Cotter Cup. Um, as that progressed on, it turned into more writing and things like that. And then eventually it ended when he passed away. Like a crazy person, I brought it back during the middle of the pandemic. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that when I became the manager of Western, I was asked some of the things that I wanted to do. And one of them was bringing back our block party um, that we had this year was probably the largest crowd we've had, um, but also was bringing back the Cotter Cup and giving the youth of Louisville the opportunity to participate and express themselves. It is for elementary, middle and high school students. So if you know any students that wanna participate, it's coming up again next year, we are planning for it. Um, but also I wanted to do this in Professor Cotter's honor. So it is a poetry writing contest. The only requirement that I have is that they participate in a, uh, in a session with the University of Louisville in uh, the University of Louisville Writing Center does tutoring for us at the branch. And that's all they have to do is make sure they attend that once. So that way, every child that comes through there has that opportunity to ask questions and do different things like that. Maybe they want to write. They don't know how to write it, but they have that chance and everybody is on the same playing field to participate. Um, we have done this now, I do believe, for three years. And it is something to see when you see the youth get up there and they hear their words reflected back to them when we're reading the poem. I see you shaking your head because you were there this year. Uh, we gave away the awards and the youth got to hear their words written back to them and it just lights them up and it's, it's a wonderful thing to see. But please keep an eye out on our social media for the library and on our website um, that we'll have more information on there. What I am going to dive into now is, um, you know, we have both press Professor Cotter and his son, Cotter Jr.'s works is in our archives. And one of the ways that we are protecting their legacies and their work is by digitizing. Um, I am a consulting party for the redevelopment in Beecher Terrace, as was mentioned before. And in doing that, um, I got permission from the library to get up and speak and ask for some money. <laughs> You have to get special permission for these things because normally our library foundation does that. I was granted a $70,000 grant so that I could digitize. We now have a digitization lab in our archives where I am trying to preserve that history because if, you know, it's like the infinity wars, you know, you snap them fingers and it's gone because it's crumbling on me and I can't have that. So, um, but I did ask for that special permission and it was granted to me. And Emma, I need to get to the website I'm going to show you guys some of the stuff that we've got on here so I am going to walk you through the lovely tour of our newly revised website <laughs> I'm sure um we've gone over a lot of different things to make sure everything was working for what I was going to show today so there are various ways to find the information that we have pre started preserving and digitizing on our webpage. Um, I wanna point out that anything that I show you today, if you forget where I tell you to go and look for it, we have this lovely handy dandy, if I get my mouse going here, search bar up here at the top, that if you come here and click on search the website first and then type African-American, archives in there, it will pull up a list for you, okay? Before you can only search the catalog, now you can actually search the website. Just make sure you click that there. If you go to branches, um, I'll just show you very briefly. If you go into branches, it's gonna bring up all of our branches. Western is at the very bottom for time. I'm not gonna scroll all the way down. <laughs> but if you click on the picture, it's gonna give you the branch hours, a little bit of a blurb about Western. But where we're going to focus on is right here where it says research and African-American archives, okay? So on this particular page here, if you, for example, wanted to come to Western and take a tour, because we do give tours, or if there was information that you wanted to see in our archives, if you click right here where it says schedule an appointment 
to schedule for either one of those. The only thing I ask is when that box comes up, if you want something from in our archives, the more detailed information you give me, the better. Because what I like to do is do the research before you get there. So I'm mindful of everybody's time, you know, because I can only, we're short staff. So I can only give you about an hour of time and I want to make sure you get the most bang for your buck. So if you click on that there, that's that particular form. As we scroll down, here is where it says writings and lectures are the papers of Reverend Blue. If you click on the name, it takes you to his profile, information about him. Same thing here with Professor Cotter. So the Cotter papers are together. We're putting junior and senior together under the listing um, because there's just so much. <laughs> it's just easier to do it that way. Um, these links here take you to their personal pages, but this here will take you to his digitized works, okay? Which I just made public yesterday, which that's a public announcement nobody knew about. Um, it's a work in progress. There are 15 documents up. When I tell you it takes a lot per document. Woo. Okay. So here is where I'm going to start at right here with the Western Digital Archives. There's always going to be another, other things added to the collection. Each time you go into it, you're going to see various pictures that take you in here. This is Western when it was before we added the ramp over here on this side. You will see it used to say colored branch up above the door. Down here in the bottom, it used to say that all of that has been removed for political correctness. Um, but if you scroll down and you go in here, there's only one document in this right now. I'm going to talk about this very briefly. Negro housing problem in Louisville, Kentucky was written by a gentleman by the name of Harlan Bartholomew. He traveled all over the United States to write things just like this for different governments that helped form redlining. I'm sure many of you have heard about that. If you've heard about the Ninth Street Divide, I have been told this is the lovely document that helped to create that here in Louisville. It is not an easy read. Um, the language is very hard to take, kind of like when Emma was talking about the images. It is hard to read, but it lets you know the mindset of how we got to where we are and what it's not going to be easy to unravel those kinds of things, right? But this is the particular document there. Um, let's see here. We're going to go in here to Reverend Blue stuff. So in Reverend Blue, this is the original staff at Western. This lady right here with her arm bent is Rachel Harris, the children's librarian. Um, I, it took me a while to figure out who she was. I had to do a whole lot of research because we don't have the names on the pictures. I tell people all the time she probably stands like that because she was going to knock some kid out. But she was super, super sweet, I'm sure. Um, I've heard nothing but great things about her. So if you click on browse, it's going to give you the list of the things that we have that were in the blue papers, okay? Um, along in here, you're going to see different things that talk about the kinds of lists that he puts together. There's some documents, and I'll just click on one very briefly with his handwriting. You can see cursive. Uh, we got to save our kids, y'all. They can't read cursive. They're going to be able to read this. Okay. So we're going to try to do some transcription at some point, hopefully, but that's far off into the future. I will probably be retired. Um, but these are some of the different things that you can see the things that he was writing about back then that we are doing today. He was very ahead of his time. So let me go back. And then in here, you'll see with the photographs that we have, you'll see some of the different things of what it looked like. This is in our meeting room. Our meeting room was cut in half to create the archives. So you have, um, you know, we were the community center. There wasn't any place else to go. We were it. And sadly, in the area where Western sits, we're still kind of it. There's not much else for kids to do. We're still that whole community center and everything vibe. Like it was one of the things I wanted to make sure that we did when I became the manager of Western was to get back to the roots of what Reverend Blue did and become even more embedded into the community and thriving on that capacity. But you can see they were doing musicals. They were doing all kinds of things back then. Um, we have the pictures of the Douglas debating team, a mother and a son reading, you know, different things of that particular level. You know, I always like looking at the pictures and looking at what the kids were wearing and looking at their faces when they caught them off guard because some of them now they're just staring at the camera kind of crazy. Um, but that's some of the fun stuff to look at there. Then um, before I get into Blue's papers, not Blue's papers, but Cotter's papers, I'm going to scroll down here a little bit and show you. These are some additional databases that we have access to with your library card. If you don't have one, this is a little plug, get you a library card. So 
down here, uh, historical black newspapers, um, Louisville Defender. A lot of people want to access the Louisville Defender paper. That's where you can get access to that. The Chicago Defender printed a lot of information for Louisville, like in the 1937 flood. So if you're looking for things on Cotter, Western, just things in, in general like that, of that era, those are the places to go and look. But when you go into it, there's a long list of other newspapers that are there as well. The historical black newspaper database is fabulous. Um, then we also have Black Life in America and Black Freedom Struggle in the US. Other additional databases that if you're looking for something and we may or may not have it in our archives, these may be some additional places for you to go to. But up here, let's look at the manuscripts of Joseph Cobb. So this is senior and junior. And then there we go. So some of these, you'll see there's a baptism certificate. Um, some of the different things that he wrote, there was a lot of, we had a, a document, I'm trying to figure out exactly how I want to put it up there because on one side of it, he was, you can tell Junior, is this Cotter Junior, was just taking papers and scribbling on whatever he had on. But if you flip from where the poem is, you flip to the other side, it is the paperwork that he had received a letter on his uh, supplies for his tuberculosis treatment. So it reminds you of the things that they were really heavily grappling with during that time. Um, and I'm trying to figure out if I want to make it two documents, if I want to make it one document, because, you know, that's just figuring out how to do these types of things and putting that information in there is very critical to making sure that when someone goes and they're searching the database, they can find them under different, you know, subject headings and things of that nature. Um, but you will see like the introduction to the band of Gideon, which is, you know, Junior's work. Um, there's others that had wrote things about um, Junior that in dedication, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, with, you know, um, different things like that. You'll see where Joseph Cotter, this may be the document, I can't remember for sure. But yes, he's talking about in 1894, Paul sitting in his living room. You know, and lets you into uh, an insight into what their life was like during that time. Um, but these are all things that you can go in and check out. I am going to go back to this page. And when you come here to learn more, this takes you to another page for Western. This video here, um, we used to have a much older video up that was very outdated. <laughs> Not just the clothes and the look of Western. I mean, I was like, woo, <laughs> it was a flashback in time. So we redid the video for Western that talks about the history. I encourage you to go and check it out. Hannah Drake does our voiceover for it. Um, if you don't know her, she's a local poet. I'm all about this poetic theme, if you notice that there. Um, but this also, if you scroll down, it shows this is the house when they were in the room, three rooms of the house on Chestnut Street where Western started. And there's other pictures there. Over here on the side, it talks about the Douglas Debate Club. There is the timeline for different things. There's the profiles of those that we have already spoken of. If you go into the timeline, it's going to walk you through most of the things that I've said very briefly today. Um, talking about Albert Mazik, you know, coming down and looking at, you know, when Western first opened on October the 28th, um, 1908 is when the building opened. You know, but it started all the way back in 1905 in the house. You know, going down, if you look at this picture here, there's Cotter and Mazik. You know, if you go to Eastern Cemetery, there's a lot of them all are buried all in the same area. And we're still doing the Figures of Eastern Cemetery program as well. So I'm a little plug for that. Um, and we're still sharing those voices. And if we do the program on a Tuesday, on that Saturday, we go to the cemetery and we visit where these grave sites are. So that people can see that. And one of the places, of course, that we stop at is Reverend Blue's headstone. So these are some of the different things here as well that you can look through. Um, what I will say is that um, trying to protect and preserve all of this history is heavy, but it is extremely important um, to make sure that it's not lost, you know. Um, these are just the highlights in my amount of time up here. Like Emma said, we could go on for days, um, but there is so much more that can be said. I would like to encourage you to come and visit Western and take a tour. Come and see our beautiful building, um, our archives, the mural we have in our meeting room on the wall. 
take a walk through history and see the legacy that is the Western Library. I would like to encourage you to think about your own personal archives. Each of you in this room today have a legacy. Every photograph, every written word helps you to leave your mark on this world. Share with your family, and if, you, if there are those in your family that you don't know their history, I encourage you to learn it. It is up to us to protect our legacies and share our family history. As I often say about Western and libraries in general, if we don't use it, we lose it. You know, it is up to us to make sure that we're protecting those types of things. Um, Reverend Thomas Fountain Blue was a true pioneer in all that he did as a librarian. Professionally trained or not, he paved the way and made it possible for me to do what I do today. Professor Cotter was also a pioneer and led the way to help promote education and help youth to learn the power of reading and storytelling, that it is important to share your words and writing and we honor him with the revitalization of the Cotter Cup. Being the manager of Western has been one of the greatest honors of my life. And I thank you for allowing me to share this rich history with you today. Hey, everyone. My name is Bernard Clay, and I'm starting to regret that slide, but whatever. <laughs> yeah. uh, do we need to see anything? Y'all don't need to see anything, do you? I, I could just. Is this fine? Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'd like to thank Emma for inviting me here, the Filson Society, for having me here. Um, I really appreciate the work that you're doing um, here and the great work on that particular project, the conversation with Minstrelsy and um, and Carter, I think it's very important and needs to not be ignored. It needs to be acknowledged as a part of our history. Um, even though it hurts, it still needs to be acknowledged. Um, I'd like to also thank Natalie. Um, so my connections with um, Potter go really um, deep, I guess, and I wasn't aware of it, but um, Emma invited me here because she found that I read one of his poems online. And I just happened to read one of his poems online because um, I found out about him while I was writing this book um, and it inspired a poem I'm gonna read later to write about the neighborhood I'm from. I'm from the Parkland, um, Southwick neighborhood. So I wrote a poem about that. Um, and then in wanting to do more research, I went to the Western branch and did went into the archives and Natalie and her great team helped me uncover some more information. So much information, I didn't really dig into it until this week. Um, and when in reading it this week, um, I found out that um, Carter had an uncle named Montgomery Greathouse. Well, my family, my great great grandmother's name was Edith Greathouse. So somewhere up the line, me and Mr. Carter are relatives. He's a distant cousin of mine. So it's very apt that I'm here doing this and that I've been feeling this drive to cover um, Joseph Seaman Carter because it, it's, it's something pulling me to do it. It's a part of my innate legacy, which is very important that we're talking about that. So I'm not gonna go too long. I know we got a very short amount of time. Um, so I'm gonna read a few of his poems because he was a talented poet within his own right as has been spoken today. Um, and, and his poems are in conversation with the greater society. And Emma was quite right. Um, he's having a conversation about blackness before blackness was articulated. Um, and so I'm gonna read a poem. She, was, she mentioned um, Booker T. Washington, Dr. Booker T. Washington. He wrote a poem about Dr. Booker T. Washington. It's called Dr. Booker T. Washington to the National Negro Business League. Tis strange indeed to hear us plead for selling and for buying. When yesterday we said, away with all good things but dying. 
The world's a go and we're a gog to have our brief inning. So let's away through surge and fog, however slight the winning. What deeds have sprung from plow and pick? What bankrolls from tomatoes? No dainty crop of rhetoric can match one of potatoes. Ye orators of point and pith who force the world to heed you, the skeleton, what skeletons you'll journey with ere it is forced to feed you. A little gold won't mar our grace, a little ease our glory. This world's a better bidding place when money clinks its story. Um, the next poem I'm gonna read is, is a more direct, is, I think this is a more um, direct um, articulation of what blackness is. Um, it's called the, the nation's neglected child. And you can sort of insinuate who he's talking about when he says neglected child. I am not thy pampered steed. I am not thy welcome dog. I am a lower breed, even than the Berkshire hog. I am thy neglected child. Make me grow, but keep me wild. Man must do the work of men in tomorrow's harried race. Will our nation knuckle then? Will she fear the victor's grace pace? Excuse me. Let her see what virtues lie in her teacher's prophecies. Blood will find the breed of blood. Art will prove the worth of worth. Knowledge yields in flower and bud. Love will stay the crumbling earth. These are but the strings that roll from a trained and trustful soul. Thank you. Uh, no, no, no. I was just letting you know it was the end of the poem. <laughs> no need to, no need to clap. I wasn't even going for that. Uh, so, um, so, um. A very famous writer, or uh, song writer, I guess, a lyricist, uh, Stephen Foster wrote a poem song called My Okataki Home. Um, and so there's some very problematic parts of that song. I don't know if you know the original text of the song, but there's a lot of mention of the word darky in it. Um, and I don't want to offend anybody, uh, but yeah, there's a lot of, and so very early on, uh, Mr. Carter, Professor Carter um, recognized this very early on and suggested some updates to the song. Um, I'm just gonna read a couple of the verses. Um, er earlier verses, he he replaces the word darky with Negro, but he gets more into like a, a direct address. And this is sort of a response to art, right? Um, he does an, a direct address to the speaker of the poem. So, I'm not, I really don't want to do this in the, the song, but I'll try. How's it go? They hunt no more for the possums and the coon. Okay, okay. It's all right. Oh my, oh, it's a, oh. how's the verse go? Oh, yeah. They hunt no more for the possum and the coon on the meadow, the hill and the shore. They sing no more by the glimmer of the moon on the bench by the old cabin door. The day trips by with the solace for the heart to charm it and give it delight. The time has come when the Negro does his part to make my old Kentucky home all right. The time has come when the head will never bow, whatever the Negro may go. A few more years and he, he'll show the nation how he will thrive through sugar cane grow. A few more years and he'll shift the weary load so that it will never be light. A few more years and he'll train up the road and sing my old Kentucky homes all right. Uh, 
I am not a singer. And I definitely am not very fond of that song, but um, <laughs> uh, so um, in that poem, he's responding to a piece of art, a piece of Kentucky art. He's responding to a poem. So I had, and in a way, it's an aphrastic piece. If aphrastic means that you're writing about art. Um, he's he's responding to a, a, a song. I wrote an aphrastic piece where I'm responding to uh, an event that happened to me where I went to the state capitol and there were some statues in the rotunda. I don't know if you've ever been to the state capitol right now. I think those, those statues are gone. But if you went to the rotunda within the past few years, you might have saw some of these statues. Um, and this is called the Enchanted Rotunda. In the capital rotunda of this once Switzerland of the states, the men of historical stature stand, all sculpted from solid bronze, crowned around Lincoln's brown effigy. His backbone metal, cape thrown, ready to strut all six feet four inches of lanky body onto the great lawn to free the slaves again and again. But behind Lincoln, a traitor rose, conjured by Jim Crow wizardry, chiseled from white Tennessee marble, the president of a figment, Jeff Davis, self-proclaimed Mississippian, his chalky hands vice gripped, rigid body cocooned within his cloak, his eggshell gaze looking down on Lincoln's head. Only in that rotunda, did Jeff Davis tower over Lincoln. There, Davis was the only labeled hero on his exaggerated pedestal, which redacted the rivers he ran red with the blood of the poor, whose children's children's children made sanctioned pilgrimages there, bust from the hollers and the cul-de-sacs to pose at Davis's milky white feet, because this, they were told is their heritage. This is what makes them greater. And I'm gonna read one more poem and I, I'm, I'm running us out of time and I wanna save some time for questioning. Uh, but this last poem I think is very important because this is the poem that like learning about Potter inspired me to write about. I was like, I didn't know there was a, a Joseph Carter and I didn't know that he was considered the mayor or maybe not the mayor, but um, I found all this out and I was like, well, what else about my neighborhood do I not know? And so this poem is sort of like um, a sediment. Like I'm going, each stanza, I'm starting at the present and I'm going deeper and deeper into the history of the neighborhood. So follow me as we go. And this is called Recycling the Neighborhood. New Park Duval, always just Duval. Since I was born, now rebranded, regentrified, a sugar outer shell of pastel vinyl cloned homes of, on postage stamp lots, crowding and dashing into the interstate obstructed horizons, barred in by the shadows of coal ash smokestacks. Here, Backyard gardens grow out of the rubble of a plowed over projects. Southwick and Cotter Holmes projects, a 50 year experiment I grew up adjacent to, named for the white developer who always owned this land and the black mayor of the town sacrificed for this monstrosity of terracotta buildings knotted up and down the single pothole street dead ending at a police station where cops were soldiers doing tours of duty in that little Africa shithole. Little Africa, sometimes called Black Parklands, other times need more, forgotten hamlet of freed slaves, self-governed, self-educated with plank streets, brown brick businesses, wooden cottages crammed and cobbled to the river, community growing like an orange trumpet vine from the bog black earth of this once bypassed marsh. Ignored, avoided swamp, nameless estuary, too many mosquitoes, too much stink to do anything here, 
back before emancipation, before Beargrass Creek became our sewer, and it still flowed through the middle of what is now downtown, feeding enough fertile sediment to build the first Louisville upon. Before Corn Island too got all used up by this city, leaving only a spangle of stones visible when the Ohio River is shrunken by drought. Thank you all for letting me share, I appreciate it. I gotta say a couple of things. I am so sorry to my thesis committee members who are in this room, and I I meant to thank you, um, Dr. Doctor Dr. Tyler Fleming and Dr. David Anderson, ladies and gentlemen, were on my thesis committee, and they helped me in two very specific ways that I wanted to point out. Dr. Fleming introduced me to Cotter, told me about the archives at the Western Branch. Dr. Anderson helped me, Dr. Anderson is a poet and a writer and, and helped me understand what Cotter was saying. Um, and I just really wanted to thank you both for being here. It means so much to me. Um, and I wanted to point out from um, our, our um, lovely, um, um, Museum Collections um, Specialist, that's not your title, Maureen. Maureen would like to invite you all after this to come over to the Carriage House. Um, it's the last day of um, our Rosenwald Schools exhibit, A Better Life for Their Children. And it has a direct connection um, to this talk um, because Booker T. Washington was involved with that project in those schools. Um, so go on over to the Carriage House after this, check out those photographs if you haven't seen them already. I think we're ready for questions. On up and uh, and ask them. I'll also, from a from a collections and exhibits perspective, point out uh, for folks as you're leaving here, you'll notice the the sheet music that we have up along the walls yes, here. Thank uh, and thank you, Bernard, for reading yes. uh, Joseph Seaman Cotter's response to My Old Kentucky Home. We start that uh, that exhibit with a first edition Christie's Minstrels, My Old Kentucky Home, and a statement there that says that all of these images of Kentucky nostalgia uh, that, that get popularized at the turn of the century in this mass produced sheet music were rooted in the minstrel stage. And we give Cotter that opportunity to talk back um, to all of those, uh, those images that you'll see up there. So please, uh, as you're leaving the, the auditorium today, please go check those out. But now, um, please, questions if anyone has any. Last thing, sorry. <laughs> Yes, please purchase Bernard's books. Natalie is featured in a chapter of, if you write me a letter, send it here from the Louisville Story Program. Um, and please support the Western Branch of the Library. Check out books, go to programs, and donate here. The, the QR code is going to take you to the foundation, um, but if you can write a check, make it out to the Western Branch Library Support Association and, and write Natalie Natalie's name there, please. Um, I think that's all now. Yep. Hi. Uh, I, just, I just had one question. Uh, what are the boundaries for Little Africa? In oh, do you know? I think Does anybody in the room know the boundaries of Little Africa? Sherry Brent Hamilton? <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry. Do you know yeah. Mariel? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, the, the, the reason I ask is, yeah, I was raised in the West End. Okay. I was raised on 34th Street. 34th. And, and uh, of course, I always thought of Park Duval mm -hmm. neighborhood as being Little Africa. Now, yeah. Apparently, that, that is the case. So, yeah. I just wanted to verify in my own mind. Yes, that's okay. correct. Yeah. Little Africa is now Parkland, Park Duval. Yeah. yeah I would agree with that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What? And Chickasaw. Um, I, I have a question, and I just wanted to make a very brief statement. So the question is, how far along is the digitization of the Cotter papers? And the my question is related to kind of why I wanted to say how important those papers are and how thankful I am that you're digitizing them that both Cotter Sr. and Cotter Jr. 
as well as another local fiction writer and poet, George Marion McClellan, are part of a very important gen transitional generation of Black writers from the post-Reconstruction era into the Harlem Renaissance. And um, Joseph Seaman Cotter Jr., in fact, was publishing in the crisis in the, I think, in the early 20s, right before he died. The crisis is one of the main publications of the Harlem Renaissance. He was actually starting a drama writing group that was going to meet at Plymouth Settlement House shortly before he died, basically, would have, which would have been Louisville's answer or participation in the Harlem Renaissance itself. And in fact, I think Cotter was instrumental in shaping the collection at Western Library, which not only had national newspapers, major writers, they even had sheet music by prominent Black composers, including Samuel Coleridge Taylor, the great Black British composer for whom the middle school uh, you know, included. So anyway, I, I, I yammered on. <laughs> but those papers are important. His scrapbook, which is an important way of looking at what writers were reading, how they collected material, and how they filtered literary influence. The collection of Western Library itself, all of that is central material for understanding Black writing and Black cultural thought prior to the Harlem Renaissance and feeding into it. So having said all that, <laughs> Where does the digitization stand? Thank you. So, as with most places, we are short-staffed. Um, but I do have four boxes of Cotter's papers digitized. And I am going through them now and cleaning up metadata that, like you would see on the screen, that is attached to it. Like I said, there are more Cotter papers than there are blue papers. But we got the blue papers done first because obviously he was the leader of Western. Um, but we do have four boxes done. I have more that I was going to upload. I'm like, I want something to be published so that I can present something today. So there's 15 up there now. There will be more up there as I have time to add them on. Um, but there are a ton of documents in each folder. But we are four boxes in and probably have a good 10 or so to go. There's, there are a lot in every folder. I mean, it's not like this. It's like this. It's just packed. So there's a lot of meticulousness, making sure the lighting is right. And you got to scan it just right. And they were just writing on the back of whatever he had a paper. He was inspired. He was writing it. He didn't care what he had. Um, and some of them are a little faded. So I'm trying to make them a little darker so that you can see what it's saying. But we're there. And, and just keep an eye on it. I'll be adding them on there pretty soon. Questions? Well, I think this what this calls for is some informal conversation with our speakers um, after we give them uh, a well-deserved round of applause. 